much. And um, a big thank you in general. Because the, the whole Beagle voyage, um, I was on the ship for just over eight months, um, and its subtitle was very like the, the um, we're concentrating on here. It was for the future of species. Um, so a lot of this is uh, what the Beagle Voyage was about for eight months. Um, but it was publicly funded. And every morning in my cabin, um, I didn't pray to God, but I did say thank you to the taxpaying citizens of the Netherlands. <laughs> uh, it's an amazing thing that that kind of support um, is there. 12 million euros for a huge nature project. Um, and I took home from it mostly a feeling of fantastic optimism, hope, because every coastal city, everywhere we called, um, well, I would visit the local natural history museum if there was one, but we'd also make contact with um, organizations like this, uh, the zoo and organizations for nature. And of course, one gets uh, a skewed picture. But I thought, in, even in the poorest places around the world, there was a great change in attitude. Public opinion is swinging behind um, organizations that are still a uh, spear point like this. But I'm sure that public opinion is changing. Um, and Darwin knew this process and describes it beautifully. And the main example I think we could compare this movement with is um, the final abolition of slavery. And as he says, slavery, although in some ways beneficial during ancient times, is a great crime. Yet it was not so regarded until quite recently, even by the most civilized nations. It took... Um, it took dedicated people, as we've just seen here, people who produce this extraordinary um, semi-obsessive work, uh, love of something besides themselves, to finally um, bring about the abolition of slavery, um, a tremendous battle. Uh, and I think, I think that he's really, he's right. That, Part of the reason here, the great emphasis on education um, and the young people we've seen, the young heroes, not oh, Hanlon's heroes are all old and most of them are dead, but um, there was the future, a wonderful thing to say. And as Darwin again says in The Descent of Man, the wishes and opinions of the members of the same community expressed at first orally, but later by writing also, either form the sole guides of our conduct or greatly reinforce the social instincts. Well, all this effort is going to be worth it, I'm absolutely convinced. Um, we are altering the social instincts, movements for um, the future of the plants and animals uh, on our planet and in the seas. And, well, we have a lot to fight against, the Saba knows. Um, a little gorilla that I adopted in the Congo, I think after about five months of journeying, he'd, um, anyway, um, in this particular village, which was a very rough, uh, warlike place, uh, this little gorilla was being played with by the children, his mummy being speared in front of him, cut up into stakes. And I do understand the logic of it. This is the things that we have to alter, just an example. So I was told, I said, you, you really shouldn't uh, kill gorillas. And this man with me, uh, outraged um, with some justice, and said, but you, you come from the West, you're all stinking rich. Your land must be packed with gorillas. So that's one problem. Um, and the other I quite understood too, that uh, you eat a gorilla when you're planning on a low level war with your next door group of people, a tribe. And if you eat gorilla meat, you become strong as a gorilla. And if you really believe that, um, it, it works. And I thought, well, yes, uh, I used to think, why in Oxford 
Am I forced to go to all these boring lectures by these old professors, um, people like me now? Uh, wouldn't it be much easier just to eat their brains and be done with it? You'd get all your knowledge. Um, and I had a friend in Oxford who was very uncomfortable there, really. He wanted to be in the great open spaces of the country that we all came from, or the continent in the middle of Africa. Um, now, his name was uh, Ian Douglas Hamilton, and he, uh, in the long run, has done more to save the African elephant, of course, than anyone on earth. Uh, and his tutor, we shouldn't forget, I would never forget, he's one of my heroes, um, <laughs> called Nico Tinbergen, a great Dutchman who went to Oxford and transformed the whole study of biology in, uh, in England and in America with his uh, emphasis on animal behavior and his own wonderful work. Well, he was very tolerant uh, and he was the supervisor of Ian. Um, and Ian was in a panic one night. He rang me up, um, and he didn't have to fill in the details, and it's obvious he was far too aristocratic to own a suit. Only the middle classes own a suit in England. Um, well, I brought mine here, but I was told not to put it on because no one would know who I was. Uh, <laughs> and in that bag is the very suit that Ian Douglas Hamilton wore to win his viva and uh, his doctorate, a remarkable piece of work on animal behavior, as applied to the African elephant. He always thought big. Um, and he was in love, still is, with uh, his wife now, Aurea, she's called. Now, she was a very different character. And my wife in Oxford at that time, she had um, made beautiful clothes, and mostly silk, but Aurea, wanted very special garments in suede. Uh, now, in this building in the corner of a street in Oxford, I had a room at the top, and this story's worth waiting for. Um, <laughs> I could look down, and there was a narrow lane leading up. Now, the, the vans for this department store had to reverse in there was no beep, beep, beep in those days. And then drive out as well. And there was plenty of room for two to pass. Uh, and it happened all day long. And so I'm looking down, and on the corner is actually the shop called Anna Belinda. And you could look in, big glass windows and all the beautiful clothes. Uh, and on the right there was a fitting room. Um, where when you... Um, when you were naked, perhaps you were supposed to stay in it. But Aurea, she was so delighted that her suede bra and her panties fitted so exactly that she came out prancing round the shop, waving them over her head and shouting, They fit! <laughs> and I was looking down and there was one van reversing out of the department store and the other drive driving in and the drivers were, as I would have done, were looking into the plate grass window going, <laughs> and it's amazing. I mean, five, six miles an hour, the damage you can do when two vans collide. <laughs> absolutely crumpled them up. And the two drivers got out, and they were still looking through the window. And um, I wonder what they're going to tell the boss. And Aurea, of course, absolutely delighted, as I found out later. Um, so that's the point of the story, is that I think for really great conservationists, as the theme has been here, for individuals who will change the world, um, their, their parents have a, have a lot to do with it, I think. Uh, there's Ian Douglas Hamilton, a really great, serious, obsessive um, conservationist, and a woman just packed with energy. And what is the result? Here you have it. <laughs> Galton's Curve in Saba. who in her relatively short life has probably done more than either of them to change public opinion.
it has to happen, I'm afraid, through television, through film, through through the written word a little bit, yes. Uh, and it's, it's really changing. Nature programs on televisions across the world are the most popular um, of all, unless, unless, of course, you're in Holland and you'd like to watch uh, Farmer's Wives rather than um, O'Hanlon's Heroes. Um, but the physical thing I brought back, the real memory uh, also of this trip, was look, there is hope. We have done extraordinary things. I say we, but in the past. Uh, the law of the sea was changed by public opinion. Okay, it's not, for most things in conservation, it's not perfect yet. There's still the Japanese and the Norwegians hunting whales. But uh, we saw vast amounts, uh, to me, I mean, I wasn't expecting it, it's what I really mean. Uh, pods of sperm whales, you see this tail come up and the, and the sort of nobbles on it, you know it's going down for maybe up to six kilometers, and then we'll be able to find its way back to exactly where it dived. Uh, animals we hardly understand. But the wonderful thing is they're not being hunted, or not being hunted by most of the nations of the earth. And in Puerto Madryn, the Stad Amsterdam put in this beautiful, beautiful ship, uh, and it was tied up, um, and I'm preparing, well I was actually reading about um, Alfred Russell Wallace and Darwin in the long room, um, quite late at night, and uh, the boatswain yelled down, and, well first of all I thought, it's very odd, uh, we're moored, we're, we're, we're right up against the quay, and, and the ship was moving like this. And then a bosun yelled down the stairs, Redman, whale to port! And I got upset, and that, oh my God, there was a whale to port. Um, it wouldn't impress a wonderful photographer of the year because it was a southern right whale, uh, so called because when they're harpooned, they float. And so it, its name lives with it, but it's no longer being harpooned. So that in itself is a wonderful thing. And there, she was, I knew it was uh, she because the calf was beside her and the calf weighs uh, um, three to four tons at birth, so, well, it must be painful, but <laughs> she'd got an itch, she got a terrible itch, she was going, oh, oh, scratching herself and the ship was going, woof, woof, <laughs> so that's what it was, and then she just swam off, and I thought uh, how it was just seemed so miraculous in the lights of the harbour. And sometimes there are so many um, uh, female right whales in this in this bay that it's quite it's difficult to bring a ship in. Um, they're doing really very well, uh, but well, there's a problem with krill perhaps. But it, we, we just cling to these stories that that are really magnificent success stories. And when I was first taken, this is the last story, um, uh, I'll have it myself, and we uh, have taken ashore in Patagonia, uh, and there is this vast penguin colony of uh, Magellanic penguins. Now, there were actually two huge colonies, uh, 300,000 pairs in each. And I said to the guy, well, why, why do you think 1830s, why didn't Darwin mention this? You know, maybe he's not a very good observer. He couldn't possibly have missed this. And he said, what do you mean? Uh, the first pair, they come, they come in 1950. <laughs> see, they've been brought back to. And then you could see again, like the name of the southern right whale, you could see uh, the, the past, the horror that we've defeated. There were the great rendering vats for oil. Now everything used to go in. Whale blubber being rendered down into lamp oil for the cities. Well, just oil. Uh, and penguins make very good oil too. But all that stopped. And there were the relics. And I think that in the future, well, we've seen the future. They would be my young heroes. And uh, Saab is a bit of a hero. I mustn't say heroin, of course. And... <laughs> Um, it's a great privilege to be here, it's, it's superb, but that's the message, that, that a lot of the parts of the world are not quite as bleak and uh, terrible. Great changes have happened. They still, of course, as we've just heard, they need to be, uh, even in, in Africa, you have to keep, keep watching, be vigilant. But it's a magnificent thing. And as David Attenborough would say, uh, we, I think we could congratulate ourselves because it's also, as he's very keen on it, a moral, a moral matter. 
we may, we may not um, believe in God, but we should certainly believe that we are as we are. Now, the curators of this planet and responsible for all the magnificent, the wonderful, complicated, intricate life on it. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you.